You know, I didn't really have a handle on how to talk about it. Um, because, you know, obviously, when I made that comparison between Eli Shai and Adolf Hitler and the quotes attributed to them, you know, it, it triggered some people, how, including those people that wrote about me, how dare you put them in the same phrase, speak of them in the same sentence. Um, but as things get worse and worse in the country and people speak openly of ethnic cleansing, then you know, what language do we have? What tools do I have to, 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 to discuss it with? And I didn't know really how to resolve this. And it was only when I uh, went to South Africa, I did a talk in South Africa in 2010, that something became clear to me. And, and I'll share that with you. And maybe it will provide a way to, to move forward. Um, so when I was in the South, I don't know if any of you have been to Johannesburg. Um, I highly recommend that you check out the Apartheid Museum. It's an excellent museum. Um, but there's one specific aspect of it that really stood out for me. It's close to the entrance. There's a wall there with these plaques, a series of plaques, 121 plaques. And in, on each of them is inscribed, as you see, the Criminal Procedure Act, the This Act, a list of all the different apartheid laws. Apartheid laws, plural. For some reason, it didn't... You know, I had never conceived of it in that way. I guess I just assumed that it was one big law. This is the apartheid law, and we passed it in Parliament, and now it's official. I didn't realize that it was essentially a fabric, a matrix of many laws, uh, over 100 laws, that together, all together, made up uh, the apartheid regime. And once I realized that, well, then I realized that we could. Can we, can we call Israel an apartheid state? Personally, I'm not invested in that argument. Or are we allowed to call Israel apartheid or is that beyond the pale? You know, is it too offensive to use that, that verbal coupling? Well, for those people, I'm not really interested in parsing, you know, in coming to a con definitive conclusion, but for those people who are and want to know, is Israel apartheid or is it not apartheid? Here you are. You can create a scales of apartheid. Look at that list. 121 laws, okay? 121 laws on the books. And just compare and contrast, look at the Israeli legislation and see how many of these apartheid laws have their parallels in the Israeli context. Is it 30? Is it 50? Is it 70? I don't know. I haven't done the math. I invite anyone who's interested to calculate and then assign Israel a score. Determine what's its apartheid score. And in some ways, we can do the same thing with Nazism. Um, I, some of you have maybe seen this countdown clock. It's a nuclear countdown clock started back in the 50s when scientists realized that because of the Cold War, we were, close, we were coming ever closer to what potentially could be a global apocalypse. Um, seemingly in recent weeks, uh, you know, Trump is edging us even closer to that potential reality. So these scientists got together and they created this atomic clock. The idea is that the hand of the clock shows how close we are to obliterating ourselves, okay? As the minute hand approaches the 12 o'clock mark, it means that we are getting one step closer to our own annihilation, okay? And in this way, these scientists could give us a visual reminder of how dangerously close we are to our destruction. And so perhaps, Potentially, we could do something similar with, you know, Nazism. And now you can go to the next slide. So perhaps what we need is not yes Nazism, no Nazism, but rather a Nazi countdown clock, okay? Because I, I don't think there's anyone here that will deny it. We're not in 1945. We're not in 1944. There's no death camps. There's no concentration camps. There's no gas chambers. There's no crematoria. Okay, so we're not there, okay? We're not at that level of genocide. But are we in 1941? Are we in 1940? Are we in 1939? There's benchmarks along the way with which we can measure. Are we at the point where we put a stamp on the passport of every Jewish person, the J-stamp? Are we at the point of Kristallnacht? At the, we at the point where, you know, and so there's various stages along the way. Nazism did not occur one day. The genocides did not occur from one day to the next. 
There was a long process of ramping up racism, and step by step by step, uh, the space with which Jewish people and other minorities in Germany could occupy shrunk, and over time eventually led to the, you know, the, the decimation of the Jewish people in Europe. Um, we're not in 1945, but we're somewhere, everyone is somewhere on that, on that Nazi countdown clock, and maybe this can provide us with some kind of language um, to understand, to reinforce for us that things in Israel are horrific and that they're getting worse and they could get much worse and we don't want to wait till we get to that point. If I was the only person speaking of this, that'd be one thing. But just last year on Holocaust Remembrance Day, it wasn't just David Sheen. It was Yair Golan, the deputy chief of the Israeli army who said, if there's something that frightens me about Holocaust remembrance, it's the recognition of the revolting processes that occurred in Germany 70 years ago and finding signs of them among us today in 2016. So this is coming from the deputy chief of the Israeli army and actually a top candidate to become the next chief of the Israeli army. Now, in the United States, this is their Nazism, right? Just as the Nazis were the white supremacists of the European continent, the KKK are the Nazis of the American continent. And here we have American magazines openly comparing Trump to the KKK, associating him with the KKK, unabashedly. I think we can agree that Netanyahu has done far more damage than Trump, although admittedly Trump is the is, uh, commands a much larger army, but Netanyahu has been in power for far longer and has gotten away with a, with a good deal. But Trump, even German magazines, can compare him to the KKK and even make allusions to Nazism, to Hitler himself. Okay. Um, Time magazine can talk about Nazism in America, but when Time magazine talks about Benjamin Netanyahu, this is how they frame him, King Bibi. So obviously there's a huge disparity between what we're allowed to say about even an American president and what we're allowed to say about an Israeli prime minister. So um, this is the last uh, little piece before we break, but I wanted to just give you one last um, segment that may help you understand how we can talk about Netanyahu. To, go at, we're gonna ha we're, to understand, we're going to have to go to New York but not New York of today, but rather New York of 100 years ago. So at that time, um, many people here may not know this, but there was tremendous, tremendous poverty at that time. People living in horrific conditions. Um, and not only were people living, under, were you know, adult Americans living in these conditions, but sadly, um, even children there was a massive child homelessness problem, if you can imagine this, in the streets of New York City 100 years ago. Horrific. And in this context of poverty, you, you, you know, these are some of the fashions at that time, and um, in the garment industry that at that point hadn't really been exported to the third world yet, so-called third world, um, in New York City is where a lot of the sweatshops were, where some of these fashions were sewn, uh, often by immigrant women, uh, mainly Italian women and Jewish women, Eastern European Jewish women, Jewish immigrants and Italian immigrants. And uh, these are some of the women that uh, worked in that field. And a hundred years ago, very sadly, there was a fire in one of these buildings. Uh, and we, we're not really sure how it broke out. Maybe someone was smoking a cigarette, but in any case, it just ripped through the entire building. And, I mean, it was, it, 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 it really was something that was uh, horrific in the sense that, you know, the entire building was gutted. And I'm going to show you some very disturbing photos right now. I just want to prepare you. You may want to look away. Um, not only was the place itself gutted, but you can imagine for the women who were there, um, they had no choice but to jump out the windows because the owner of the factory you know, had locked the doors 
and didn't provide fire escapes that were operable. So when the fire broke out, these women were not able to escape and climb down the fire escapes and the landings. And so these women had no choice. As the place began to fill up with flames, they actually threw themselves out the windows. And you had bodies and bodies of women just you know, littering the ground, even like falling through the ground into the basements below. The, the streets were just covered, like 150 women and girls died this way on one day. And um, of course, it, it, it ripped through the immigrant community of New York City. Um, it was a very difficult moment. But afterwards, what was interesting was that those women, uh, their sisters, you know, and their, their comrades decided that there had to be an end to this, that they had to fight for their rights, that they were being exploited, and they were going to stand up and protest in the streets and demand better working conditions. And it's thanks to women like these that we have some measures in place today for working women and working men and because of this struggle. Now, if you notice some of the photos from these protests after the death of these 150 women, you see, as I said, a lot of these women who died were Jewish immigrants. We mourn our loss, United Hebrew Trades of New York. Um, what's interesting about this photo is they're standing in the street in front of this storefront. Uh, it says in Yiddish, uh, at the time, um, you know, big, as I said, Jewish, Eastern European Jewish immigrant. Um, and, and so this is actually the uh, offices of a Yiddish newspaper in New York City, the, the Groysa Kunde. And so here's a, here's a copy of one of their newspapers. And you see on the front page, uh, in response to this horrific uh, incident, they actually published this cartoon, this political cartoon. And here you have the overseer, the owner of the sweatshop, working with a whip and the, the people themselves, you know, slaving away with holes in their clothes and sweating and creating clothes for the master. And on the other side, you have uh, an image of the Pharaoh of Egypt, you know, the historical oppressor of the Jewish people. And he says in Yiddish, I've translated it into English, Jews once worked for me in Egypt, but never like that. Okay, so what's happening here? So, and keep in mind, this is in the 1910s. So this is before the Holocaust, okay? In the post-Holocaust era, Adolf Hitler, the Nazi party, they are considered, you know, the worst enemies ever, the greatest oppressors of the Jewish people, the, the hands down. There's no comparison. But pre-Holocaust, Pharaoh of Egypt is the historical arch enemy of the Jewish people. He, just as the KKK are the Nazis of America, he was the Nazi of Jewish lore. He was the, the, the ultimate evil of Jewish history. And so what this cartoon is saying, what this Jewish newspaper is saying, and their front page cartoon is, as bad as the Pharaoh of Egypt was, as cruelly as he oppressed the Jewish people, the owners of these sweatshops are even crueler. They are even worse than the Hitler of their time. And the owner of that sweatshop, the owners of that very sweatshop where all these women died, they themselves were Jews. Okay? Yes, many of the women who died there were Jews. And the owners were Jews as well. And so what this Jewish newspaper was saying was, you were worse than Hitler of our time. The Hitler of that time, you're worse than them. So the Jewish community of that time and the Jewish left of that time did not hesitate to criticize the paragons, you know, the, the captains of industry, the leaders of their own community were not exempt from the most harsh criticism that they could express in Jewish terms, okay? Today it's Hitler, then it was Pharaoh, and they did not spare them the most harsh criticism. And we need to reclaim that. We need to reclaim the right to make the harshest criticism 